You look great. Yeah. <laughs> you guys keep it down out there. <laughs> hey guys, what's going on? Kyle Krieger here. Welcome back to my channel. And today we are hanging out with bum, ba -da -bum, ba -da -bum. Omar Torres. <laughs> I know um, your fans have been just like demanding that I come back and they've just been knocking on your door. Where's Omar? Where's Omar? Where's Omar? And I'm like, Kyle, I'm busy. Here he is. Well, first of all, we want to start off to say that Omar has been vaccinated and that I um, came to New York, I quarantined and got tests on both sides and they both came back negative. So we feel very safe. Um, so we just want to get that out there. Secondly, um, I recently asked on my Instagram um, questions because I wanted to do a two part video series on mental health because it's just, I love therapy and it's so very important to me and I just thought it would be great as Omar is a therapist that we could sort of discuss anything that you guys wanted to talk about with a therapist that you may not be able to ask because you don't have one. So I asked on my Instagram a Q&A of like things that you would ask a therapist and we got so many so, questions. So, so many really good questions yeah. too and some like fun ones. Y'all are pretty smart. Yes, <laughs> I have no qualifications in mental health or therapy, this is like just my opinion. Omar, however, is a, um, a clinical social worker, mm -hmm. licensed in New York, and he has much more experience about this. So if you take any insight from today, probably really should be taken from him. Yeah, so <laughs> that's an excellent point. Don't listen to this one. <laughs> um, but I also just want to preface today's video by saying that this is purely informational and for entertainment purposes. A lot of the questions that we got were so good um, and it required a lot more like thought and conversation than this video would be able to have the bandwidth yeah. for. So, you know, take everything I say with a grain of salt, take what's useful, leave the rest, and just keep in mind that this video is no substitute for just like good old fashioned therapy. Yeah. Okay, so what are we gonna talk about in today's video? So today we're going to talk a little bit about some general therapy questions like when to start and what are some questions that you can ask a therapist yes, sure. and, and, like, yeah. and, and how do you know if your therapist is a good match for you as well as discussing you know how to manage all the emotions that are coming up for all of us during everything that's going on in the world, in the country, you know, as tensions kind of rise, how to manage all of that, which I think would be also a good segue yeah. into discussing some depression and anxiety questions. Well, can't wait to get to that. <laughs> Let's get started with our first question today, which is sort of a doozy. Will I ever get over the Trump era? No. <laughs> We, none of us will. And this feels so current. And, and big. Especially because what happened this last week with the insurrection and him inciting it and I mean the whole year and like the massive death that we're all processing and the virus and the mishandling of the virus and, and it's just so much, there's so much. I would go on to say that you don't have to get over what's been going on, honestly. I think yeah. this is gonna be one of those things where we will be seeing the sort of like repercussions of this for decades to come oh so yeah. <laughs> you know there is a healing process that I think is required and that is necessary and that is on its way to taking place I hope uh, but yeah I mean like the short answer is like you don't have to get over what happened um, that it's more about recovering and learning how to navigate this world as it is yeah okay this is a good one how do you accept your straight family members I mean <laughs> you don't. Yeah. <laughs> Kick them to the curb and screw them. Um, I mean, that's kind of what I want to do. <laughs> well, how would you suggest to our friend here to how to accept their straight family members? You know, they were born this way. <laughs> so our next question is from Josh. She says, how do I stay mentally stable in an unstable house? That's a really good question because a lot of us are in situations that yeah. we can't easily escape. You know, so instead of giving you an answer like five steps to feeling better in a terrible situation, I, I'd rather offer you some questions that will hopefully help you get to some answers or interventions yeah. that might be helpful. But, you know, some of the questions just right off the bat um, have to do with who are your sources of support, right? So in an unstable household or in an unstable environment, do you have one ally or one source of support that's there that you can sort of like continue connecting with and staying close to. And it doesn't have to be a source in the home or in the environment. It could be someone online as or well. Chosen family source. Chosen family source. I would also ask things like, 
you know, can you carve out some alone time for yourself? Um, are you able to limit interactions with the folks that are causing you the most distress? Mm -hmm. um, and are you able to sort of physically remove yourself from the situation or the environment, even if it's like for five minutes, yeah. um, to go for a walk or to do some grocery shopping or whatever, uh, little bits of that. You know, you're not also not alone. I think that's important to recognize or uh, rather to say, because that was one of the more popular questions we got. Mm -hmm. um, so you're not alone. I, I hope that's helpful, knowing that it's not just you, that there are a lot of folks out there that um, are watching this and are standing in solidarity with you, wondering the exact same thing. So, you know, any bit of uh, help that you can get from that, you know, feel free to take it. <laughs> Just linked onto the last one of any advice for lockdown gays having to stay in an unhealthy environment due to quarantine. Is there anything, I mean, everything you just said is great. Is there anything specifically for, I mean, I guess maybe chosen family. Right, and to stay as connected to your community yeah. as possible, to stay as connected to um, folks that can empathize with you or relate to you yeah. in some way, especially if it comes to your queer identity. Uh, and it doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, like an in-person conversation. You can feel connected to someone mm -hmm. who like posts videos or who has a podcast. None of this is normal. So trying to figure out what's best for you, there's going to be a lot of trial and error and that's okay. Some stuff will stick, some stuff will feel really good and others like will be, you know, kind of like, ah, I don't really want to do that anymore. And that's totally fine. I haven't put down my phone for since March basically. Okay. Like, I mean, I literally have just been on my phone, like, disengaged from the real world and engaged in this, like, yeah, this world, yeah. waving through a window. <laughs> um, so, basically, what, um, this one question is, how do you preserve your mental well-being when fit muscle gays rule Instagram? Ooh! And, like, I realize that I'm not the one to answer this question, but I do get that it's because we're so engaged with our phones, you know, we're seeing people that are traveling to Puerto Vallarta and like, and those people are potentially shirtless and it makes you feel like I have my, I got like, I've been eating like I'm in quarantine right. and I don't feel great about my body, so. The conversation around how we consume content mm -hmm. uh, has been gaining traction. And like you said, especially now that our resources are limited and we're sort of like, now we're like on our phones and computers more than ever before. Yeah. So that is a relevant question. I mean, the first question that I would pose to anyone that feels similarly is what are you consuming as yeah. far as content goes? And editing that. And editing that. And you have a say, you have a lot more say in what you are consuming than you think mm -hmm. you do. I also realize that I follow very fit, handsome men on Instagram, and I've sort of, the ones that I've least interacted with, and the ones that make me feel, or like have this ideal that I, is just ridiculous, I've edited those out, mm -hmm. unfollowed them, and substituted them with more activism, mm -hmm. people-based people, or stuff that I want to be involved in. Uh, when it comes to asking questions about, you know, how do I feel good about myself when there are all these like fit, you know, individuals around me, don't ask us. Ask the people that are doing the work that are really fighting for body positivity. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm not talking about like fit dudes that are hashtagging their pictures with body positivity. <laughs> I'm talking about like larger people and larger bodies and fat bodies and asking those individuals, mm -hmm. how do I maintain like a healthy sense of self mm -hmm. in the midst of what I'm seeing on my Instagram? Editing what you're consuming is a great start. It's mm -hmm. certainly not the only thing to yeah. do. But I think that's a wonderful start. Following, you know, creators that are either like really creative, um, following mental health accounts, following, you know, I don't know, like a plant account. You know, just like, uh, <laughs> and not boys with plants. Not boys with plants. <laughs> How to best manage or digest the increased stress of the world we live in today? What are the things well, that I get find? into therapy? Yeah. <laughs> but right, first, and and that's probably like a good <laughs> sign that like. Therapy might be great for you yeah. at this at this moment. To, yeah, if you're asking. Right, if you're asking, and that a lot might of us be, are, and we all are, mm -hmm. so you're not alone. So one of the things that I try to help <laughs> my clients do is to like not add to the anxiety by normalizing the anxiety and just sort of telling yourself that it's okay to feel anxious. Yeah. So that way, at the very least, 
you are zeroing in on the anxiety, not the anxiety, and then the anxiety about the anxiety. Yeah. That's what it tends to make that whole process so, so, so much harder. So one of the things that I find really helpful is asking people that I trust how they do it. Yeah. So I've enjoyed a lot of our conversations around like, you know, how we manage anxiety or how we manage like depressive tendencies. And even just hearing from someone else, like, well, this is like what I do, and this is like what helps for me, uh, can feel relieving in a yeah. few ways, because it's like, oh, okay, I'm like not alone in all of this, and oh, here's someone that is engaging like in their anxiety and depression in this mm -hmm. way, like I never thought of before, mm -hmm. right? So for me, when it comes to coping with anxiety, I am pretty task oriented, like that helps me. If I can focus on like, yeah reorganizing my closet it's oh, low stakes i love yes organizing my life so it's really really low stakes now if organizing your closet is causing the anxiety <laughs> that might not be the best route for you for me like i don't really care like about yeah. my closet so that's something that feels like i can sort of redirect my traffic like the thoughts in my head towards this like really simple task of yeah. just like organizing it and it just helps me give my brain a break from the anxiety, um, and that's sort of like, you know, what, what I find particularly nice. So clean your closet. <laughs> Glad they're paying you two hundred dollars now. Um, this is from my veterinarian, who I love so much. His name is John. What is? I don't know if he wants me to make this anonymous, but oh well. Um, what's with imposter syndrome, and why do so many of it suffer? Uh. So let's let's tell them what imposter syndrome is first. Because Wonderful. I feel like we should just define it and mm -hmm. then we can talk about it. Mm -hmm. So imposter syndrome is this incredibly common sort of phenomenon where it's almost like there's a voice in your head that's saying, if people find out the truth about you, you're screwed. Yeah. And it's this sense that you're faking it or faking your way through something, which then adds to the sense of paranoia almost of being found out and then just like being ruined <laughs> because of that. I mean, that's how I feel about Instagram. If everyone knows how I operate online, then they'll be like, oh, you're not. It comes down to, to anything I do. I whether mean, it be work or friendships or and it's across, out how awful I am. It, and it's across the board, right? From someone who is, you know, creating content on social media to lawyers to veterinarians. To veterinarians. It's something that I've seen every, you know, size and shape and background yeah. of human being manage and deal with, so you're not alone. One of my favorite things to do is to sort of engage with that voice a little bit, and I like to start out by sort of just like acknowledging that the voice is in there saying like, you're a fake, like they're, <laughs> you're a fraud, they're gonna find out about you, by just sort of gently saying, I'm on to you. Like, to the voice, right? Like, I'm on to, I know what you're trying it's to like do. like the emoji with the, uh... The magnifying glass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's that. like, I see you. <laughs> and it just helps me at first inject a little bit of levity into an otherwise really stressful situation. Yeah. I get to kind of like laugh at myself, like, okay, like this is something you've done before. Like, all right, here we go. Um, and it also helps me minimize the strength of the voice. Mm. And I talk to it as though I'm kind of like suspicious, right? Like, you're, like I'm onto what you're up to. I know what you're up to. And that helps me minimize the impact of that voice. So a really good place to start, I think, is how to find a good therapist, especially if you're not in a big city and uh, where there's options. So can we talk about a little bit like how you would suggest people going about finding the counselor to be with? Yeah, so first and foremost, it's okay to try on a few different therapists, try on like it's a pair of jeans, but it kind of is, but to try a few different therapists like and an interview, see 100% uh, and most therapists do offer some form of like free consultation, like a 15 minute phone call. And I think that's a really great way of gauging their style and gauging the dynamic. I mean, I know you've talked about your relationship with your therapist with me before. Mm -hmm. Like, how, how did you know, or why, what is it about that relationship that feels like a good fit for you? The way that I found my therapist is through a recommendation. So I found a friend who loves their therapist, and then that therapist recommended another queer therapist to me in my area. That's, yeah, so like word of mouth, yeah. which um, and, is kind of tried and true. And then I went for a first session, and I sort of, we sort of had like an interview, and I was like, this is amazing. Mm -hmm. Like I was just like, you get it, you're queer, or I think, you know, he's an older gay man, 
and he just gets it on a level that I was like, this is it. So, right. And these are sort of new. And I've had experiences where I've had a previous therapist in New York where I went in and I was just like, this was great, thank you, but like I feel like it's not a match. And so I didn't go back. Um, and then I've had an experience in New York where I was in couples counseling, mm -hmm. fell in love with that therapist, not literally, but loved the, the insight that I got and the progress that we were making. Um, and so after couples therapy, I continued on with singles counseling. Mm -hmm. Yep. The other really important part to that question revolves around like limited resources, right? So if you don't live in a huge city with a ton of resources, what can you do? And what I'm noticing now, which I think is wonderful, is that a lot of therapists are becoming more and more open to, you know, online mm -hmm. sessions, whether it's through Zoom or through some other form. So feel free to get creative and to explore resources outside of your town, maybe even outside of your state if that's possible. And there are more and more online mental health mm -hmm. platforms that are popping up that are offering services to people all over, not just folks that are in their town or in their city, but all over the country. If you're queer or LGBTQ and you have an LGBT center in your city, you can also reach out to resources like that and see if they have recommendations for sliding scales, um, a therapist or a therapist in the area that they know of that are pro-LGBTQ that you feel comfortable talking to and maybe even have free, free services at the LGBTQ center. Mm -hmm. Some cities or like um, the suburban areas around cities have that, so it's an option. How does the first session go with the client and what sort of would someone be able to expect? So I can't speak for everybody, but I'll... Actually, please speak for, for This is exactly how I'm going to paint with a really broad stroke, right? <laughs> um, but here are my first sessions go. So I usually like to break down a first session with a client by letting them know, like, so this is what today is going to look like. I'm going to give you my spiel, which is basically just like, you know, a reintroduction, like, you know, so here are my credentials, like, I'm the best there is. here's how long I've been practicing, or, you know, here's my cancellation policy, sort of like the logistical housekeeping stuff I'll go over again. And then I'll go over things like expectations, meaning here's like what you can expect from me, here's what I'm expecting from you, I'll give them a heads up about the fact that I like take notes during my session so they're not like, what's this guy doing, like, is he doing a crossword puzzle? Um, and so I basically <laughs> just let them know, like, here's how today is going to look. And then I use that as a segue into, you know, the very, very popular first session question, which is what brings you in today? Yeah. And that's when we just sort of like dive right in yeah. and start having the conversation about like what motivated them to seek help in the first place. And it can even be like, if you're like, sometimes uh, I'll feel like when I'm going to therapy, like I don't have anything to talk about mm. this week. But especially in the beginning, I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to talk about, but I just feel like I need to talk to someone. That it can even be as like, you can even say like, I don't really know why I'm here or what I want to do here, yeah. but I just want to be here and like, can you help navigate this with me? And, and yeah, and then your therapist hopefully will say like, sure, let's start here. You know, that their, their job that you're paying them to help you navigate your thoughts and process and, and history and, and whatever. So it can be anything. Some of my favorite sessions started out with the client saying, I have nothing to talk about today, yes. or I don't know what to talk about today. And I'm like, oh really? Well. <laughs> and then I'll pull out my like file of things that I've been keeping in the back of my head the whole time. You're yeah. like, well, what about this? I think it's because the client comes in open yeah, to like right, like to whatever direction that we take, and those sessions can be a lot of fun yeah. sometimes. About like, what do you guys? Um, someone asked, what do you write down on your note? What are you writing down on your notepad? I love that question. And you say, you think notes? I, yeah, so I basically just map out the conversation. That's what I'm doing, right? So there might be themes that I'm noticing that I'll write down, uh, key players in the story that I'll write down, like, oh, Kyle, I'm getting right? Uh, <laughs> or, get or, <laughs> or uh, I might have a question that I want to ask, not in that moment, but for later yeah. on, and I'll just like write that down and keep all of that in the back of my head. So one is, do therapists sometimes need therapy? And my answer is, not sometimes. All, All the time. time. <laughs> if you're giving treatment, you should be in treatment, right? For sure. Now, I want to specify. <laughs> I mean, we're going to name it. It doesn't mean forever. I, I don't mean like you should be in yeah. therapy every week for the rest of your life. <laughs> but, because uh, taking breaks from therapy is 
fine, that's perfectly reasonable. But yes, therapists, absolutely. You know, we deserve to have time carved out where we can talk about like our stuff too, right? So yes, if we're actively engaged in the process as far as like providing the treatment, it's it's good practice to be like on the other side mm -hmm. uh, of yeah. that, you know, room and engage in your own therapy. Should a therapist identify as the same as their patient to provide a more holistic treatment? As a gay man, I love having a gay male experience, an, an, an older adult, someone who's older than me who has more life experience who's also a gay man. Mm -hmm. I feel like I love that. What is um, it about that that resonates with you? Why does it that just help? feels like we're a team? Yeah, and yeah. like his experience is very similar to mine in some ways, where he understands the nuances of what it means to be a gay man, and I don't have to sit there and explain to a straight man like I don't even know what. But it just like I don't want to waste time in detail. Mm -hmm. I mean, yes, but not when it comes to like. I just want you already to have the experience. Right. You want there to be a foundation of knowledge on their part. Yeah. That helps inform, you know, the the session mm -hmm. essentially. Like I want them to know what it feels like to come out. Right. Even if they came out to a family that was very accepting, um, and my experience was the opposite. Mm -hmm. Like they still know that fear of like when I say this, I can never go back. Straight yeah. people just don't know that. Yeah, some boots on the ground experience. Yeah. So to speak. So do you want to have any insight on this? So the annoying thing that I'm gonna say, it's like our classic therapist response is that there's no right or wrong answer to this. What you touched on, which is really important, is that it, you felt like you were working with a teammate. That's the most important mm. thing, right? So you can make a strong case for both. So some folks, for example, want to work with someone that on some level shares like an identity with them for the very reason that you stated, which is like, you know what it's like to be a person of color, like navigating certain situations mm. and, like, and you know what it means and you know, you probably have experienced it yourself and thus can like offer me help and mm -hmm. suggestions. And then there are other instances where I've heard people say, I actually want a therapist that's like so far removed mm. that it feels like there's a healthy amount of distance between like their experience and mine, which I totally get, right? Mm -hmm. Because you don't have to identify in the same way in order to experience empathy in order to have the experience of feeling like someone is on your side mm -hmm. and that you're collaborating with them. Yeah. So it's really about personal taste and style. Um, so I feel like we should talk about one of the main themes that we got questions on, which was current mental health, anxiety, and depression. So a lot of us would be going into therapy because we feel depressed or like our mental state has been fractured a little bit and we feel unsettled or whatever. Um, anxious, can't sleep, all those things. So we got a lot of questions about that. And um, one of them is, what do you do when you're heading back into a down phase in your mental health? And mm -hmm. we both agree, I think, that yeah. we just say like, bucket lift. Yeah, I remember us reading that question and we just like took a really deep breath after reading it because it's just so real. It's just so real when you find yourself recognizing like, oh, I'm, I'm heading into like a funk. The way that I engage with that is by, again, first starting out by saying like, okay, here we go. And not pretending like it's not happening, but just sort of acknowledging here are the variables that are or that may be contributing to it. Or I'm feeling depressed and I have no idea why. Yeah. Just starting out there with just sort of like the facts, like this is what's happening, is a great, could be a helpful start. It's like a way of normalizing mm -hmm. and validating what's going on for you. Um, one of the questions I thought was another theme that we got to is why do I seek validation and how do I stop it? Yeah. And you and I both agree that, I mean, especially like we were talking about earlier with social media, like validation is something that we seek and whether it be with a partner, with a friend, with online, no matter what. Mm -hmm. um, and so very normal for us to seek and we shouldn't really beat ourselves up about it. To start off by saying like validation in and of itself isn't bad. Like mm -hmm. a performance evaluation from your job, right? If your boss says, great work, you are just killing it at work, that's validating, that's validation. So there's yeah. nothing inherently wrong with it. One of the questions or one of the many questions that I would start by asking is like, where am I seeking it out and is it sustainable, is it helpful, yeah. or do I end up feeling like worse afterwards? Those are just some questions that you might want to ask yourself. Um, at what point does recreational drug use become addiction and how would 
um, the user identifier. Um, well, as a lot of you know already, I'm 13 years sober, a crystal meth addict, and an alcoholic, and I've been there. I would try to convince myself over and over that I was just recreationally using crystal meth, which is like not something I sort of laugh at now. When it comes down to it, um, it's self-diagnosis, right? I mean, like being in therapy, you, your therapist can help you ask questions to help you lead to a point where you can hopefully diagnose and be like, yeah, I feel like maybe I have an issue. Find yourself in these unmanageable situations where your life is sort of falling apart and it's mostly because your drug habit, you're probably an addict or alcoholic and maybe could benefit from a 12 step program or therapy or whatever. For me, it was just more of like, I had lost everything and I was like, well, there's, this is the last house on the block is a 12 step meeting. Mm -hmm. So I went there. However, I do believe that there are people that use drugs um, and drink, and I feel like that are, there are people that abuse drugs and drink, mm -hmm. and then I also feel like there's addicts. So I do feel like there's different stages of using. One can lead to another, but I don't necessarily think that like... That it's inevitable, yeah. that it will for sure lead yeah. to another. But if you feel like you're, you know, if you have to like, if you take a dry January and you're white knuckling it, like maybe that's an issue. This is a really good opportunity for you to ask questions about your relationship to drug use when you say recreational like what exactly does that mean that's what i would ask what do you mean by recreational once a week once a month once a year every day i have no <laughs> idea right so i would i would start there yeah and in the same way that you would assess like a friendship right like is this person is this person supportive you know do i feel like i can trust them you know do they have my back like you ask those questions about friendships or any relationship you can ask similar ones about your drug use just like what's their role in my life? Yeah. And do I have any concerns or does it feel okay? Does it feel manageable? My, my first question was, am I powerless to this? And mm. the answer was yes. Yeah. Like, is my life unmanageable? Yes, mm -hmm. it's kind of falling apart. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was like, yeah, maybe I should seek assistance or some help. Um, so why is it hard to find your own happiness? Mm. And I'm tired of this depression. So first and foremost, I want to say that these questions resonate with me so hard. You're not alone. It's one of those things where it's like, how could you not be feeling stuff mm -hmm. right now? Hard emotions are hard. So to find yourself struggling with depression is kind of like, if you think about it, a function of health. Like if you punched me in the face, I would feel pain. And I wouldn't say, and struggling. I wouldn't say like, why do I feel pain every time I get punched in the face? No, I'd be like, yeah, that's what happens when you get punched in the face, it hurts. Yeah. And so when things, and so when life throws like curveballs at you, or even if it seemingly everything feels curve fine, boulders. or curve boulders, I like that. Depression and feelings of anxiety, they're hard. So it is perfectly reasonable mm -hmm. to find yourself or to feel like I'm really struggling with this stuff. Yeah. One of the things that I love to practice when I'm feeling really, really sad or in a funk or really anxious is a little bit of like self-compassion meditation, which is a moment that I take for myself. It's just like a minute and I will sprinkle it throughout the day or I'll sort of like bookend my days with it where I'll just close my eyes put my hand on my heart and this just like helps me connect with my body and I'll just say really really simple things like it is okay to be sad mm. uh, I know you're struggling it's okay to struggle or you've felt sad before you will get through this again mm. or you will eventually find your way on the other side of this again okay guys so thank you so much for tuning into this video Omar thank you thanks for having me I know you all missed me so much <laughs> we are gonna do a part two and the part two is gonna be about love and relationships and self-love um, which will come out around Valentine's Day so Woo! buckle in for that and stay tuned um, so Omar where can they find you if they wanted to find you so I do have a website, Omar Torres Therapy. If anyone is interested in, you know, reaching out to me, possibly connecting um, to a therapist or, you know, starting, you know, the work together, Omar Torres Therapy on Google, I'll come right up. Um, and otherwise, you know, this one will tag me and stuff and you yeah. can find me <laughs> there too. You but him and his Sarah Michelle Geller. Obsession. Yeah. Obsession. Um, yeah. And then you yeah. can find me on Instagram and I guess I'm back on Twitter too at Kyle Krieger. Woo. And yeah, now that Trump's gone, I'm like happy to be back. On <laughs> um, so yeah, thank you guys so much for tuning in and we will see you at part two. Bye. Bye.